Well, it's good to see everybody out. <clears throat> so if you notice some of the construction done at the church, uh, you know, you know Ray is, give him a thanks, because uh, we got the door, we got a solid core door up here now instead of a, a panel, you know, like a hollow door. So he did all the work there. And wasn't just an easy, quick swap. You know, actually had to cut the bottom at 31 and a half, and the top was 32, so I had to cut diagonally. <laughs> and on the hinge side, to kind of make it more difficult, is cutting on the hinge side also. But looks incredible. Put the wall downstairs, if you go down and look, there's a wall in front of the lift tank. Things are looking really good. And um, just thanks to all the faithful people that give and pray and help, and just from the the Lord will give us this building, you know, a couple years ago and all the work that's been done and just a nice comforting place to come and worship and believers can come and hear the word of God and thank you for all the people that faithfully give and pray and help make this place a great place. So thank you all for, for that. If you want the prayer list, you can email it to me. We do ask that people pray and we just had a great update. You know, my nephew, Dom, lots of answered prayer, but you know, we had a couple answered prayer this week. You know, and Dom was, infection has gone out of his lungs. Well, those, end up, those medications that he was taking was actually, they would have to cut back on the anti-rejection medications for his kidney. And it just was great to hear. And those medications were really hard on him. And it's just good to, to know that that infection is out of his lungs, that fungus infection. We just pray that, you know, these can get back on his full anti-rejection medications. And as an 18-year-old young man, he can enjoy life. He likes to be in the woods. He likes to hunt. We pray that he can just enjoy some of those things. Thank you for that. And we had answered prayer for our brother, Jason. Jason, is gonna, he's got some trials in front of him. But they're going to be able to do surgery. And we found out that he's actually a relative of Kevin's. And, uh, but a friend of mine, I went to cop school with him and things like that. And he works for the Department of Corrections. He's a parole agent, men coming out of prison. He's like a supervisor of the pro, parole office over there in Beltrami and Clearwater County. And, but just some answered prayer there that they can still do surgery. So please keep Jason and his wife in prayer. And, uh, but again, it was answered prayer. God is so good to hear our prayers. And uh, then you know when he answers them, that's just a blessing. And then we had little baby Shelton born too. Prayers for... That baby and that boy, and mom healing, and just a, the fruit of the womb is a blessing. We love little babies for sure. And it is a blessing to have babies in the church, that's for sure. If you want to give to the church, it's in the back. Um, I did uh, have some announcements, so I had, we did pretty much talk about them in the prayer requests and things like that. But we have Bible study Wednesday nights, 6.30 to 7 is prayer meeting. We take prayer requests, and then we pray, and then 7 to 8 is you know, Bible study, so if there's anything you want to share or you want to uh, give a testimony or you want to talk about a question, it's a great place to come and ask and have fellowship. And, and, and uh, we welcome anybody out. And you don't have to talk if you don't want. You don't have to read if you don't want. I don't want people to think they have to say something because they don't have to say anything. And um, it's a good time, though, just to have fellowship with believers. We have seven points of truth. We know that every week we review the seven points of truth. And it's, as Peter says, you know, we need to be reminded of these things continuously. We really do. You know, reminded that we're sinners. We deserve to go to hell. We've missed the mark of perfection. You've got to be perfect to get to heaven. And, you know, we're born in sin. We're conceived in sin. It's this, what you see. You see my sin nature. It's this, the flesh. Flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet people will try to clean the flesh up but it has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. It's a flesh nature. It's a sin nature. We're born in sin. We miss the mark of perfection from birth. This flesh nature, this, this individual deserves to go to hell. You know, I deserve to go to hell. My wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And going to heaven is truly a gift. Nobody deserves it. Nobody can earn it. God is not indebted to nobody. The individuals that we talked about this in Romans 4, there's a lot of people that think they can earn salvation. Well, that means you think God is indebted to you. You think God actually owes you something. God doesn't owe us nothing. 
You know, it's by grace that we go to heaven, freely, ultimately, by believing what Christ did for us. And it is a gift, a gift. Do you believe he did it for you? All you have to do is receive it. It's the greatest gift in the entire world, knowing that I'm going to heaven. And you have to be perfect to get there, and none of us are perfect. Your name's got to be written in the Lamb's book of life. Not even a lie shall enter into heaven. Revelations 21, 27 is, There shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. If man allowed, if God allowed man to enter heaven without a new nature, heaven would just be like earth. We would ultimately corrupt it, just like we've corrupted ultimately this creation. That's what sin does. Sin brings briars and thorns from the earth. That's why we have thorns. That's why we have briars. Every time I get poked, I'm thinking of sin because that's exactly what sin. Sin has cursed this earth. And ultimately, we will live, live in an absence of sin in heaven one day. And one day, I'll get a new body that is absence from, absence from sin also. Anyways, your name's got to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And how do you get your name in there? It's all by grace. Simply for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. Not of yourself means not of yourself. Yet there are people today that say saving grace is not alone. Well, when it says not of yourself, it means not of yourself. There's nothing that you can do to add to the perfect redemptive work of Christ. Yet people today continuously say, ah, you got to do this, you got to do that. Your life's, no, you don't. Not of yourself. It's a gift again. You know, we receive gifts, gifts at Christmas. We don't deserve them, but those are gifts. You know what, your name's on it. And just like the name is your name, your name is on the gift that Christ gives. You know, do you believe he did that for you? It's simply receive it by grace through faith, what he did for us. Grace, unmerited. You know what, you don't deserve it. So good. We know that Christ died for our sins. 2 Corinthians, bless you. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? Sinlessly perfect. We know that he was tried, he was tested to prove that he cannot sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We know that when he was hanging on the cross, he gave up the ghost. Like Kevin said, when they beat him, they spit on him, they punched him, they whipped him with a cat of nine tails, which has bone and little pieces of, you know, probably more just bone and, and other chunks of broken clay. And they would whip and that would stick in the flesh and they would pull it out. But ultimately we know Jesus died in strength. Man did not take his life. God could have lived in eternity without blood. He could have lived in eternity without, in looking the way he did. And it is the Roman centurion that knew that he died in strength. He says, for truly this is the Son of God. Because he gave up the ghost. He says, it is finished. Not that he did not die in weakness. He did not die because man took his life from him. He, did, he died in strength. He gave up the ghost. He said, it is finished. The scriptures have been fulfilled. Everything in the Old Testament that was talking about me, about the Calvary, has been done, filled, finished. And he ultimately died in strength. And we need to remember that because he is God. In Colossians 2, 13 and 14, we know that he paid for all sin. All sin. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened. Ultimately, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way nailing it to the cross, forgiving us all trespasses. Well, people say, well, he just died for our past sins. Well, when Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago, all of our sins were future at that time. Either he paid for all of them, or his death on the cross does nothing for us. Either he did for all, for everybody, or he did, doesn't do anything else any good. But we know he died. We have scriptures that say he died, and he paid the perfect sacrifice for all sin, and that his resurrection is proof of that. It is only belief. It is only belief. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth, an open invitation. God did not die for the rich. He did not die for the white. He did not die for, you know, you know, some people in a certain country. He died for the sinner. And him being revealed in the flesh proves that we're all sinners. 
It's an open invitation. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you believe that he did that for you, you receive eternal life and that you can know you're not going to hell. That is the two promises. You can know you're not going to hell and you can know you're going to heaven. And when do you get eternal life? Eternal life does nothing for us unless we get it right away. It doesn't do us any good if we get a year from now or 10 years. Eternal life is only good if we get it the second we believe. And then we, the reason we get it the second we believe is because we get a new nature. This flesh nature that you see is going to die. When I place my faith in Christ, I'm born from above. I'm born of God by the seed of the word. I have a new nature. It's a spirit nature. And it doesn't sin. My old flesh will sin until the day I die. But I have a new nature that doesn't sin. So we receive eternal life the second <clears throat> we believe. And that's amazing to know that. And it is something that God promised us, eternal life. From the beginning, before creation was ever created, we have the everlasting gospel. Revelations, what, 14, 6. It is the everlasting gospel. And before man was ever created, before God spoke life into man, eternal life was already promised because that's part of the gospel. And ultimately that we can know where we're going before we get there. These things that are written on you believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. We can know we have eternal life. We can know where we're going before we get there. And I think the people that if they hope they get there, that's a problem. They're probably not clear on the gospel. I don't know. I'd have to talk to the individual. But if there's somebody saying, I hope, they're probably trusting in their works or they're thinking that they did something they could lose their salvation. The Bible wants us to know. Why? Because Christ paid for every one of my sins. There's nothing that I can do in the future that will prevent me from going to heaven. Nothing. That's a promise. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Nothing separates us from the love of Christ. That is standing on the promises of God. Today we talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. As we go through this timeline, prophetic timeline, we talk about dispensations, but ultimately within dispensations, we talk about specific events. And we're at the judgment seat of actually the white throne judgment. The white throne, like the white throne judgment is a wedding. And we're going to attend. And ultimately we're the bride, the church. He's ultimately bought the bride. He ultimately provided a dress, a garment for us that ultimately is his righteousness. And we're going to look at all this, some of this stuff today. But we're going to also do a little bit of a review and talk about what last week was a little bit. Revelation 19, 7 through 9 says, Let us be glad. Be glad. You ever attend, attend a wedding? And there's probably a lot of joy when a bride and a groom come together for the first time and they know that they're going to ultimately, you know, make a promise in front of God and they're ultimately they will be together, will be one, the two will be one from that point forward. Wedding is a special day. Special day, especially for the one that you love and you want to spend it with for that person forever. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. It's going to come. His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, and he saith unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. There is going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb, it's something that we get to look forward to. When individuals are going through a seven-year tribulation on here on earth, when ultimately the seals are being broken and a fourth of the world's population dies and later when a, you know, a bowl is poured out on the earth and another third of the world's population dies and when all the seas turn to blood and when all the trees are burned up, again, it's going to be the worst time in man's history that's ever going to be. We're going to be ultimately attending the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be attending the marriage supper of the Lamb. And if you're hoping, okay, you're like, you're thinking, well, I have a loved one, a friend, a brother, a sister, you know, a spouse, a child, I'm, you know, they won't believe, but I'll, you know, after I get raptured, I'll, I'll, you know, hopefully they'll believe then. I tell you what, don't wait till the rapture happens. You know, my theory is that the United States is not in the Bible for a reason. I don't think we're going to be here. 
You know, I think, you know, somehow we deceive ourselves and judgment will come upon this great nations for the, some of the voting that we've done over the last years. There's going to be consequences, and I believe the United States will be gone. That's my theory. That's not in the Bible. That's just my thought. Rush is in the Bible. Iran is in the Bible. Libya is in the Bible. Turkey's in the Bible. Germany's in the Bible. The United States is not. Just my thought. I would encourage people to share the gospel now. Bring people out to church now. The handwriting's on the wall, just like Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. That is for sure. And as we continue to go through the prophetic timeline, we will study, why do we study prophecy? A lot of people are like, well, I don't know exactly, and I'm, you might quote me wrong on this, but they say one-third or two-thirds of the Bible is prophecy. And ultimately, one-third of the Bible is still prophecy unfulfilled. These are things that we look to forward to. And why should we study prophecy? Well, we study prophecy for this specific reason, because it's all about Jesus. It says in Revelations 19.10, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If you notice that verse, it's Revelations 19.10. We just read the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelations 19.7-9. through 9. So immediately after the marriage supper of the Lamb has this verse about prophecy. And ultimately, we know the spirit and purpose of all prophecy is to testify of Jesus. The spirit and purpose of all prophecy is to testify Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. That's what prophecy is all about. All prophecy is related to Christ. If it's not, it's probably not an accurate prophecy. It's all about Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. This is why we study prophecy, because it's necessary. And ultimately, when we study Jesus, we know where he is at. We'll know where we will be also. Because where the shepherd is, the flock will there also be. The Old Testament is filled with prophecy, and we could say history, where ultimately his story is written in advance. H-I-S. It is all about his story. We know when people want to change history, they want to go back and blot out things and tear statues down, but it ultimately we know that it is his story. The prophecy is about Christ. The Old Testament talks about two mountaintops. And ultimately, Peter, in 1 Peter, you probably can't see that very well, but it's Larkin. Larkin has some great diagrams out there, and he ultimately wrote a book in 1920 and has all these diagrams in it. But in 1 Peter, it talks about how the Old Testament prophets could not discern between the first mountain and the second mountain, these peaks. This first peak here is Calvary, the cross. Then you got a big valley, and then you got up into the ground. Then you have the millennial reign, and then you have the crucifixion of Christ. And they struggled with that. They're like, so they were looking for the crown the first time he came. They couldn't discern between the two, but if they were knew how to discern, the leaders of Israel would have known it would have been about the crown. <clears throat> Christ had to die for the sins of mankind first. But between that great, those two peaks. That's what the New Testament's about, a mystery, the church age. That's what Paul was revealed. Paul, God gave Paul the, this mystery, this wisdom, and understood it's the church age, the age of grace. And that is this timeline right here between the Calvary and ultimately the rapture. And uh, that's ultimately what we're looking at, things in there. <clears throat> so when you study the Old Testament, like Isaiah 53, that is definitely speaking of the cross. We know that Isaiah 53 is speaking about Calvary because in Acts chapter 8, we have a, you know, a, a eunuch and Philip was called to the eunuch. And we know in Acts 8 there, what is he reading? Isaiah 53. And ultimately, Philip's like, do you understand what you're reading? He's like, no, unless a man tell me. And then it goes up that ultimately it's speaking about Jesus. And Acts 8 actually tells us Isaiah 53 is about Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Then you got Isaiah chapter 2 about the millennial reign. And that's what ultimately those Old Testament is all about. The first peak or the second peak. The church is not in the Old Testament. The church doesn't replace Israel like some pastors who are preaching today. Israel will get to be, ultimately get that land that God has promised them. 
And here we have the prophetic timeline, just so you can see it for yourself. You know, we talked about dispensations. You can go back and look at some of the videos. We talked about the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, the seven year tribulation last week. This year, we are this year, this day, we're going to talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. We live in the dispensation of grace, the age of grace. It is all about sharing the gospel during this age. That's what it's all about. Look at these are just a few verses in the New Testament, Romans 1, 4, 15 and 16. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you are at Rome also, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and to the Greek. It's a dispensation of the gospel, and we know the Bible tells us that in 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 17. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yo, woe unto me. If I preach not the gospel, for if I do this thing willingly, I have reward, but if against my will, a dispensation. It is God's will, the Father's will, for us to share the gospel during the age of grace. We know that the, ultimately in Ephesians 6, when we put the armor of God on, the reason why we put the breastplate of righteousness on, the helmet of salvation, the, you know, the belt of truth, the garment of salvation, and all this is for Ephesians 6.19. That we can be, you know, we can open our mouth boldly. It says this, for, and for me the utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That's what we're to do. Support a ministry that does that. You know, that's everything comes back to this. So if you're praying for ministry, supporting, financially supporting a ministry, helping at the church, it's all for this. So people can know they have eternal life through Jesus Christ. The rapture is going to happen. First Thessalonians 4, 17. It's actually that we're caught up harpazo. And ultimately comes to the Latin word, you know, rapturo. We are snatched up. It is a meeting place that's going to happen in the clouds. It will not happen here on earth. First Thessalonians 4, 17, that we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord's. First Corinthians 15, 52 through 53 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised to corruptible, and we shall be changed. Boom. This corruptible will put on incorruption. I will be given a glorified body at that time. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. The day of Christ is the rapture. We know the day of night, the day of the Lord is this part right here. We, this is the day of Christ. Philippians 1, 6, it talks about the day of Christ. We are the children of light. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5. Ultimately, we're not, we were not ultimately here that ultimately God did not appoint us to wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. But let me read those verses. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5. You are the children of light. We are believers. And the children of the day. And we are not of the night nor of darkness. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. God did not get engaged to ultimately his, his, his bride, and one day to marry, he's not going to beat her up and then get married. That's not what happens. We will not go through the tribulation period. And yet there's so many pastors that preach mid-trib, post-trib, and ultimately that's not accurate. And when you start doing that, you're not going to be clear on other things. Once raptured, the saved will give an account of our lives. We will give an account. We will stand in front of Jesus, my wife, my son, my daughter, my mom and dad will not give an account of my life. I will stand in front of God, Jesus Christ, and he will ask what I've done with the time that he's given me on earth. Have I supported a ministry? And ultimately, these people that he brought in my life, that I shared the gospel with them, that's on me. And that's between you and the Lord, and it's between me and the Lord. And whatever the Lord puts on your heart is what ultimately what the Lord puts on your heart. But we need to know that in Romans 14, 10 through 12, it says, By what dost thou judge thy brother? It's not my position here to do this and say, How come you're not? No, no, no. It's this position here. I should be looking at myself. Why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, I, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow 
to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. I will stand. If you're saved, you will stand in front of Jesus Christ one day. 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You'll be shown. You'll be given these royal rewards. You'll be given crowns. Or you'll be shown what you could have had. Again, that's between you and the Lord. At the same time, it's called the day of the Lord. Again, sin is not judged there. Sin taken care of right here. So it's about him wanting to reward us. So here, at the same time, it's called the day of the Lord. We're gonna, this is for basically the nation Israel. It's the final judgment for the nation of Israel. Judgment came upon them. It started with the northern tribes with Assyria. But ultimately, we know Judah and Benjamin started with the southern tribe with Judah there. And when they came under Babylonian rule, the Gentiles became rule of the world. One day again, the age of the Gentiles will end. The age of the Gentiles will end right here when Christ puts his feet back here on earth. And ultimately, God has given this period for the Gentiles to ultimately rule the world. The Jews will one day be the greatest nation in the world, guaranteed. Christ will rule from Jerusalem. Ultimately, he will reign for 1,000 years. How do I know that? Look at these verses right here. And we're going to look at some of these verses in the future. In Zechariah 14, 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. I take that as literal. He will be king over all the earth. And in that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one day. And his name one. When he puts his feet on earth, destroys ultimately all these Gentile nations that come against Israel. And ultimately Israel will be born in a day. And he will be set up his kingdom, and he'll rule from Jerusalem a thousand years. Look at the next verse in Zechariah 14, 16. And, I'll show, and it shall come to pass, and it shall come to pass. It's going to happen. That everyone that is left of all the nations, because Matthew 25, the nations will be judged. The nations will be judged. The nations that come against Israel will be judged. And ultimately, the nations that supported Israel will be the sheep. The nations that did not support Israel will be the goats. In Matthew 25, it says, the goats depart from me, and they go to hell. So the nations here, it says right here, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. These are things that we get to look forward to. The day of the Lord is also known as the day, that day. So if you look at, the, when you start reading Zephaniah and Habakkuk and uh, Zechariah and Malachi and Amos, you know, chapter 5, you're going to read statements that say that day, the day. In Jeremiah 37, you know, it's Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble, the time of trouble, the great day of the Lord, the day of wrath. We spent a lot of time last week on this verse, the 70th week of Daniel, the prophetic timeline. We know that 69 years have already happened. The prophetic weeks of Daniel, the decree from Artaxerxes when Medes and Persians took beat Babylon, they allowed, Artaxerxes allowed for Israel, like Ezra and Nehemiah, to go back and build the temple, build the city, rebuild the wall. From the decree, when Artaxerxes says, yes, go back, and ultimately to the time that Jerusalem was rebuilt was 49 years. That's this ultimately seven weeks. And then when from the time of the rebuilding, Till the Messiah was cut off, till he died, was 434 years to the day. 483 weeks are already fulfilled. Remember, you had those two peaks. This peak and that peak. This gap between the two peaks is the age of grace. So between the 69th week and the 70th week, that's us. We can see how it all fits together. And ultimately, the 70th week is this day here. One prophetic week is left, the 70th week of Daniel's to be completed, the seven-year tribulation. Last week I didn't share this, I should have, but there is a verse that talks about weeks being a year, and it's in Genesis chapter 
29, verse 27. And it's when Jacob deceives his brother Esau for the birthright. He has to leave because Esau is going to kill him. So he goes north to his mom's, Rachel, ultimately I think it's uh, Rebecca's place, his mom's brother's, his mom's brother Laban, he goes. And he actually works seven years for what he thinks is Rachel. But he's deceived. He gets Leah the first time. Then he works another seven, and that's what the verse says here. Fulfill her week, and we'll give thee also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. So we have a verse here that actually talks about a week's seven days, which really means seven years. And that prophetic week of Daniel, seven, that week of seven days, is the seven years of tribulation. So the 70th week of Daniel will be fulfilled. It is the seven years of tribulation. The satanic superman will come upon the scene. He will ultimately sign a covenant for Israel. Israel will be able to do animal sacrifices again. Halfway through the tribulation, he will violate that. We talked a lot about that last week. Verse in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, 4. We know the temple has to be built. It doesn't have to be built at the rapture, but the temple will have to be built during the seven-year tribulation. Because why? Because the Antichrist will sit in it. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-4, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposed and exalted himself above, above all that's called God. In Isaiah 7, I think well, Isaiah 14, ultimately where sin was ultimately started in Satan, Lucifer, the angel, and in, in, in his mind, he says, I want to be like the Most High. I want to sit above the clouds. I want to sit above his throne. Things like that. And that's what he says there. Who opposes and exalted himself above all that's called God. He thinks he's better than God. Or that is worship. And it's that he is God. Sitteth in the temple of God. Showing himself that he's God. They will build a temple. He will allow the Jews to ultimately start animal sacrifices again. They will go back under the Mosaic Covenant. At three and a half years in, he will say stop. The abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke about, Jesus speaks about it also. And that's when they're to flee. If you're a Jew, get out. It's probably where they go to Petra. So Jesus re referenced this time in Matthew, in Matthew 24, 15, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet. So we have Jesus confirming what Daniel spoke of was true. Stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. And ultimately we know that is when the Antichrist declares himself God and the whole world worships him as God. Matthew 24, 21. It's got to be a short time. Why? It says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. The last three and a half years of tribulation will be horrible. Horrible. We know it has to be short. It has to be seven years, because man would absolutely destroy himself. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 22, Except that those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. And what does he do here? He does it for the elect's sake. There's a remnant. Even though all the saved are raptured at the rapture, there will be people that get saved through the tribulation. We have 144,000 male virgin Jews. In Revelation 7 and 14, they will take the, the gospel globally and people will get saved through the tribulation. We won't be here. Where are we going to be? We're going to be tending something like this, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Pretty cool. The bride of Christ is ready. Now, if, you, if, if you'd turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5, I encourage you to just follow along. We're going to read more than one verse. We're going to read about 10 verses. And I just like uh, you to follow along in the Bible. You can know I'm not making this stuff up. And I'll give you a page number in the uh, Bibles that we have at the church. It would be page 1,290. Actually, 1,291. We'll start in verse 22. These are verses that I read at weddings. In verse 22, wives, 
Submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. If you don't want to follow along in the Bible, I do have it up here. We know the man is the spiritual leader of the home. 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it. We have a picture of what Christ did there, that he loved the church and he gave himself for it. And that's how husbands should love their wives. 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Show out men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourish it and cherish it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence, respect the husband. So I think, you know, a lot of that, there's a lot in there we could talk about, we could do a whole message on that. But ultimately, to be part of the church, we got to believe. We've got to trust in Christ alone. And Colossians 1, 8 through 20 says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. We know we're speaking of Christ. That in all things he might have the preeminence, superiority. He's the omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing. For it has pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. He's fully God. And having made peace through the blood of, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven the word reconcile there but ultimately he made peace through the blood of his cross how he died for the sins of mankind he did that for the church he did that for us to reconcile we've been given the ministry of reconciliation now reconcile means to, to bring back to a former state to bring back in favor with God. What Adam lost, Jesus brings back. Now we're actually going to be reading that in Revelations, I'm sorry, in Romans 5 this week in Bible study. How ultimately the first Adam and the second Adam, how we lost that position, we lost that favor with God from Adam, and then we've been given this ministry of reconciliation. So reconciliation, reconciliation is an exchange a restoration of the favor of God to sinners that repent. What do I mean by repent? They change their mind. Stop trusting in their works and trust in the finished redemptive work of Christ. And put their trust in the expiatory death of Christ, the finished work of Christ, the exchange of his righteousness for our sins. And listen to these verses here. We've been, this is our ministry right here. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19, 521 is part of the seven points of truth. But look at these are some incredible verses. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, positional truth, he is a new creature. There's your new nature. Old nature, new nature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself. How? By Jesus Christ. And hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. To witness that God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath commanded unto us the word of reconciliation. Those are some incredible verses. That's exactly what we are to do in this age of grace. We have the ministry of reconciliation. We're to share that ultimately God has taken our sins. And he will not impute them to us. He will impute his righteousness to our account. Great words. Now, what did the bride wear? The bride wore a robe of righteousness. 
Now, Revelation 19, 8 says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. In Ephesians 5, 25-27, we read, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. That's the garment of salvation. Christ covers us with the robe of righteousness. Beautiful verse right here, Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. And he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. And as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth her with her jewels. So we've been given this robe of righteousness that the church is going to wear. It's without spot. It's without wrinkle. It is Christ's righteousness. Now there are people out there that says, you know what, I don't want that robe. I don't want that garment. I'm going to wear my garment. And Isaiah 64, 6 says this about that robe. But we are all as unclean thing. And all, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our, our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. I tell you what, the robe of righteousness, the robe that God provides, sounds a lot better than a, ultimately a garment of filthy rags. But that's exactly how God sees us. And we need this robe of righteousness to attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. So they, the church is engaged to Christ. One day he will call the church home for the wedding feast. And it all starts with this. In John chapter 14, in the upper room discourse, he says this, and it is for us. Let not your heart be troubled. And we can turn on the news today and we can see wars and rumors of wars and our heart can soon be troubled. But we should not be troubled. We know that God is in control. We're on his divine timeline. When we woke up on October 7th in Hamas, ultimately these terrorists attacked Israel and slaughtered babies and ultimately innocent people. You know what? It wasn't new to God. We're on this divine timeline. So let not your heart be troubled. Maybe you were diagnosed with something and maybe you're just like, man, I, you know, I thought I was going to get a few more. The Lord tells us, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, and where I am that you may be also. And I've read that verse many times, but ultimately it just came to my attention that we know what we're speaking there. I believe it. we're speaking of the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem that's going to hover above earth after the thousand year reign of Christ. There will be a new earth, a new heaven, and the new Jerusalem. And we're going to get to that in a second. But where will the marriage supper of the Lamb take place? I believe it takes place in heaven. Turn over to your to Bible, to Revelation chapter 19, last book of the Bible. John the Revelator wrote it, right around 95 AD on the island of Patmos. And John, in Revelation chapter 19, will read, we read Revelation 19, 7 through 9. You'll be able to read it yourself. Last book of the Bible. But you're going to see what happens next. So I believe the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place in heaven before the second advent. So let's read Revelations 19, verse 7. We'll start. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, because we are blessed. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet. So John falls at the angel's feet. He knows better. But ultimately, you know, he's probably 
seeing all this stuff, he was probably shaken up. He's a little bit afraid here. And he said, I fell at the feet to worship, and he said to me, see thou do it not. We're not to worship angels. We're only to worship one, that's Christ and the Father. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so the spirit and the pro all prophecy is about Jesus. Now look what happens in 11. So we just had the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then something happens here in 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Now this white horse is different than the apocalypse of the four horsemen. The apocalypse of the four horsemen, I think, are over there in Revelation 5. I could be wrong, but I think it's right over there in the beginning there. And now we know Satan, the Antichrist, is riding a white horse. And ultimately, he's a fraud. Here, we see here, he that sat upon was called Faithful, capital F, True, Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. See, in Ecclesiastes, it talks about there's going to be a period. There's a period, ultimately, of rejoicing. There's a period of you know, where the cast stones, there's a period of, to forgive. In God's timeline, when he does something, it's perfectly righteous. So God will declare war, and it will be perfectly holy and righteous. No one will be able to say, you can't do that. God does everything with holiness and righteousness. And in the 12, he's, his eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had many, a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, the first time he had his own blood on him when he's on Calvary. Remember, he did not die in weakness. He died in strength. He gave up the ghost. He can lay his life down and he can call it up again because he's God in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. The second time he comes back, he will not have his blood on himself. It will be at the Valley of Megiddo. It will be the Battle of Armageddon. And he will turn the whole valley into a big wine press. And ultimately, when they put their grapes into this barrel and they stomp on it. That's exactly what's going to happen. And it's going to be a war. And it will be not his blood. His name is called the word of God. John chapter 1 right there. And this armies which were in heaven. Followed him upon white horses. Clothed in fine linen. And white and clean. We will be riding a horse. I never thought maybe there would be animals in heaven. But when I read this I'm like there are animals in heaven. I'm not a fan of horses. Me and my wife we went to Tennessee one time and we rented horses to ride in the Appalachian Mountains with the kids. And I said to the guy, I said, I want the smallest horse. I want my feet to drag on the ground. <laughs> I wasn't joking. I don't like riding horses. We have a horse and I've never been on him. I, just, I don't care for it. They pull it. All the horses were standing there and there's this one horse. He's black and he's huge. Like his back's like this high. I'm not exaggerating. His back's like this high. And like, I feel bad for the guy that gets that one. Well, they, there's about five families there. They start calling us over. And he says, this is yours. I says, I wanted the shortest one. He goes, well, you're the biggest guy here. We got to give you something bigger. And you know what they called him? What was his name? His name was King Kong, right? <laughs> King Kong. Could you not give me something like Mighty Mouse? No. <laughs> Put me on King Kong. And then we're riding through these trails and all the cobwebs, because everybody that had went, there, there has, I had every cobweb. <laughs> but I'll be on a horse again. And this time we'll be on a white horse. And the armies were in heaven and followed him upon a white horse clothed in fine linen and white and clean. And out of his mouth, so we know the word of God comes out of his mouth, it's a two edged sword. See, the Word of God cuts both ways. Ultimately, it can cut you and be like, hey, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior. Or it ultimately can cut you in the way of judgment. I reject Jesus Christ, and then ultimately the sword is going to cut you the other way, and it's judgment. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with, with it he should smite the nations. See, all he has to do is speak, and all the nations are gone. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of a fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his, th on his thigh a name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. So this is why I believe the, Revel the marriage supper of the Lamb happens, because we hear, read here that these white horses are coming down, and he'll put his feet on the Mount of Olives.
We live and reign here for a thousand years. Turn to Revelation 20, verse 4. It's a long verse. What? We have it here. Revelation 20, verse 4, look what it says. You can see in verse 2 that ultimately Satan was bound for a thousand years. In verse 3, at the end, it says a thousand years should be fulfilled. And then verse 4, and I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast. Neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. We, as a child of God, we have so much to look forward to. We will rule and reign with him a thousand years on earth. Our life is just beginning as a child of God. So after the thousand years with Christ, there is a new earth, a new heaven. And remember in John 14, I go and prepare, prepare a place for you. You know, and ultimately there's many mansions and I pray, ultimately prepare a mansion. I believe I said it's part of the new Jerusalem. Well, this is why I say that in Revelation 21, verse 2. Revelation 21, verse 2, and I says, And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. So this is after the thousand year reign. This is after a new heaven, a new earth. We know that the earth will be burned up and we get a new earth out of that. And I, John, saw the whole city, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Jesus Christ preparing this New Jerusalem for his bride. In Revelation 21, verse 9. And there come unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of seven last plagues. And he talked with me saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. We know these are things that we get to look forward to. It doesn't just tell us this in Revelations. It actually shares this with us, with us in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto a city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. And to it an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's us. Born again, the firstborn, born of the ultimately from a dead body. Ultimately, Christ resurrected, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of his just men made perfect. So we see these things, and ultimately, these are some solid things. I can see them in the scripture. Maybe, you know, there's some things might be a little bit different here and there. But these are things that we get to look forward to as a child of God. Through That's why we study this prophetic timeline because we can understand where the spirit of prophecy is about Jesus Christ. And where he is, we will be with him. And we fight from victory. Now it's the marriage. I want to talk a little bit about marriage. We've got a few minutes here. But what's the purpose of marriage? The purpose of marriage is about love. Marriage is based on the foundation of love. Love can be a motivator or it can be a restrainer. Love can actually make men do things that they would never have done in their life. Wars have been fought. Countries have won because of love of one woman. Love can be a restrainer. It can actually be a restrainer. It can actually stop somebody from doing something because you're so motivated by love that you would not want to hurt that person. And husbands and wives should love each other and make sacrifices for each other based on love. The love of a husband should be as the love of Christ. And yes, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. And that's the love that husbands should have for their wives that they would die for their family. The ultimate manifestation of love is John 15, 13. The ultimate manifestation of love is Christ. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay 
down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. Jesus Christ is love for God to love the world. We get that in John 3, 16. He demonstrated his love at Calvary, Romans 5, 8. But God commanded, demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't say, you know what, I want you to change your life before I die for you. No, he died for us in that we were yet still sinners. He died for us. Marriage is an institution created by, I was going to say government, man, but we know that's created by God. We have a government today that says they ultimately define what marriage is. No, we do not get to define what marriage is. God is ultimately predetermined in what, what marriage is. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And marriage is between one man and one woman. Marriage between one man and one woman is a picture of Christ, marriage to the church. That is the marriage supper of the Lamb. A Christian marriage should reflect the light of Christ to others, a Christian marriage should have the inspiration to others. Your marriage should be an inspiration to your children. That's something my wife and I have the desire that our marriage could ultimately, our kids could look up to it and be like, you know, that's healthy. We want to be like that. Christ never divorces the church, ever. Doesn't divorce. There's not any, that's why when he marries the church, you're part of the church. It is eternal security. It is a picture that mankind, mankind was given divorce in Matthew chapter 19. Let's read why. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. They say unto him, why did, God, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, and from the beginning it was not so. It was God's desire that it would not happen because of man, though. During this timeline, women were persecuted. Women were taken advantage of. And God knew that. And today, maybe even women are still taken advantage of. And ultimately, there he does give us the petition of divorce because ultimately... Hardness of hearts, not forgiveness, may be taken advantage of. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. The marriage supper of the Lamb, our marriage should be a picture of Christ and the marriage ultimately between the church. If you're in the body of Christ, a member of the church, you will attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. Again, these are things that we get to look forward to. If you have questions, please feel free to email me, or if you want a copy of it, I can email you a copy of my notes. The promise that I get out of this was, all born-again believers will attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. Is there a truth proclaimed? I believe there is. The wow. truth is the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, is given to the bride. And ultimately... The third application is there sin to avoid. I changed that this week to a verse to memorize. And it's John 14, 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father are many, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Those are comforting words, for sure. For sure. Let me show you something. If you're sitting here today and you've not seen this, I want to show you. Let this hand here represent you and I, and this wallet here represents our sin. See, God loves us, but he hates our sin. Because we sin, we actually deserve to go to hell and pay for that sin for all eternity. But God does love us. Sin is what separates us. So let this hand you represent Jesus Christ. He is absolutely sinless. He's God from eternity past. He's the ever-present Jesus Christ. And ultimately, he revealed himself in the flesh 
And uh, when John the Baptist was on the banks of the Jordan River, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ went to the cross and he took all of our sin, every one of them, even the ones we've not committed. He shed his blood, he died, and he rose again the third day, showing us the payment for sins paid in full. And if you'd believe that, he puts his righteousness put to your account. It is that easy. If we could everybody just have our, everybody close their eyes for a second and at home. If you're sitting at home and you've never trusted in Christ alone or here today or watching the video years from now, you know, maybe you're like, man, that makes sense. I know I can never be good enough. And maybe you're thinking, I just don't know what to say. Well, it's not what you say that saves you. It's what you believe. And maybe if you're sitting here today, maybe you could believe this if you have not. If you already are saved, you know that Christ already died for your sins, why don't you just take the time to give him thanks? But if you're sitting here today or watching the video and you're like, you know what, that makes sense. You could say something like this and we hope that you would believe this. You could say, I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. I do not want to go to hell when I die. I want to go to heaven. I will believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and was buried and he resurrected for me. I will trust in Christ alone to save me to heaven. What do you have to lose? You have nothing to lose, everything to gain. We're not asking you to make any promises. We're not asking you to change your life. We're not asking you to do anything. We're simply asking you to simply believe what God has already done for you. If you did that, if you did that today, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried, resurrected for you, you're trusting in Christ alone to get you to heaven, why don't you just tell him thanks? Take a minute here, it takes a few seconds to just say, Father, thank you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for Christ. We're so grateful for your love and your grace and your mercy. We're thankful that Christ voluntarily laid down his life for each and every one of us. We know that he gave up the ghost. He died for all the sins of mankind and he resurrected the third day, showing all mankind he paid that sin debt in full. We thank you for that amazing gift when we come to Christ by faith. We thank you for the words of life. We can, we're thankful for this age of grace. Those women that we can study the New Testament here and we can see ultimately the dispensation that we live in, but we're also thankful for the the prophetic timeline, to know that a thousand years from now, we'll be in your presence. We'll be ruling and reigning here on earth with you. That one day there'll be a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. And ultimately, this just blows my mind how good you are to us. And we want to say, you know what, we thank you for all the good you've ever been to us, because that's all you've ever been is good to us. So Father, we just pray that you'd you know, keep us safe through the week, and that you'd bring us all back next week where we can continue to read and grow and magnify who you are. And Father, we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We'll have our last song. It will be, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place.